As soon as Claire's feet touched the ground, he rolled and quickly released the parachute harness. He stood, looked around. None of his crewmates was anywhere in sight. As he searched for the best way to escape, he suddenly found himself staring at the barrels of six enemy rifles. Welcome to the Godwink Christmas Podcast with stories from Squire Rushnell. This limited series podcast is brought to you by Godwink Brands. Visit godwinks.com for more information. Now here's the Godwink guy, Squire Rushnell. One more American Hamburg before shipping out for the cold uncertainties of war seemed like a good idea to Claire Miller, a 29-year-old Air Force gunner. It was Christmas Eve. Let's go, he said to his seven crewmates, salivating at the thought that this might be the last hamburger he'd have for months. He and his buddies were departing California that night for England. From there, they'd fly dangerous bombing missions over war-torn Europe. As one of the oldest crew members, Claire had an almost paternal relationship with the others. His level-headed instinct for leadership, always counseling the younger airmen, had prompted someone to nickname him Dad. And that stuck. "'All right, fellas, who's hungry?' asked the cute, bouncy waitress. From the pocket of her red and white checkered apron, she pulled out a pad, simultaneously extracting a pencil buried in the ringlets of her curly blonde hair. "'Anybody going for the classic fat burger?' she asked with a devilish smile. "'It's smothered in fried onions, tomato pickles, and lettuce with crispy fries on the side.' There was a sudden cacophony of wisecracks and enthusiastic confirmation of orders. One airman was infatuated with the server more than the burger. "'What's your name?' he asked, smiling. "'Well, my fiancé, who's already over there fighting this war, calls me Sassy Sally. But you,' she pointed to the grinning airman, "'can just call me Sally.' For the next hour, Claire watched as the rambunctious crew dived into their burgers, kitted with Sally, and never let on that they might be the least bit nervous about the mission that they were about to undertake. As the bill came, the eight airmen tossed money onto the table to pay for their share, several telling Sally that it had been a great meal. Tell you what, "'Someone can do me a favor,' she said brightly. "'Who wants to take a picture of me to my soldier man? "'He's over there somewhere.' "'The comment caught them by surprise. "'Most of them just stared at her, perhaps wondering, "'Does she have any idea how many soldiers are over there in Europe?' "'The crew all looked at Dad, Claire.' "'Sure, let me have it, Sally,' said Claire, not wishing to disappoint her. He wasn't about to deflate her enthusiasm by lecturing her on the improbability of her request. After all, it was Christmas Eve. Sally pulled a wallet-sized snapshot from her pocket and handed it to Claire. "'Thanks,' she smiled. Then, starting to feel the significance of the moment— Her face began to squinch as tears formed in the corners of her eyes. She quickly turned, rushing off. A classic fat burger was a distant memory nine months later. When Claire and his crew were in the thick of things, their missions had come so fast and furious that they could hardly keep track of how many they'd been on. Their B-17 bomber had been attacked by enemy planes and anti-aircraft so many times that all they could do was count their blessings that they hadn't yet been seriously hit. Then one day over the Netherlands, things changed. The plane was rocked by a powerful explosion, and soon the aircraft spun out of control as the pilot ordered everyone to bail out. As Claire's chute snapped open, he heard another explosion. Their B-17 had blown up, 
As soon as Claire's feet touched the ground, he rolled and quickly released the parachute harness. He stood, looked around. None of his crewmates was anywhere in sight. As he searched for the best way to escape, he suddenly found himself staring at the barrels of six enemy rifles. German soldiers rushed toward him, roughly pushing him toward their encampment where they tied him to a tree. He spent the cold night without food, water, or covering. Before dawn, Claire was dragged into the center of a dirt road and ordered to stand. The leader commanded the six soldiers to aim their rifles at him. A second command in German was shouted, Get ready! Claire knew that the final command would be the last one. He looked at his captors right in the eye. He had but one choice, to ask God for assistance. Inside his mind, he said, Please, God, save me. Abruptly, he heard voices of teenage girls. The trio was running toward the firing squad, shouting in Dutch, Don't shoot! He's a Yank, not a Brit! Remarkably, those girls had come from nowhere. How had they gotten the courage to shout at a German firing squad? No one knows nor why Claire's nationality would have made a difference. But the soldiers lowered their guns, and Claire's prayer was answered. Temporarily, he was saved. But soon he was shoved into a crowded train boxcar and transported to a prisoner of war camp called Stalag Luft IV, somewhere behind German lines. The days passed slowly. Food was not plentiful. The POW barracks, stretching as far as the eye could see, were cold, damp, and drafty. Blankets were hard to come by. As the winter approached, the temperatures slid into the 20s. Many young men became ill or fell into a deep depression. Some elected to run into the electric fences causing them instant death by electrocution, rather than to endure the continued harshness of their fate. As was his paternalistic nature, Claire worried less about himself than about those around him. Once again, his innate leadership qualities caused others to turn to him for counsel and encouragement. They trusted this more mature American airman who seemed secure in his faith and values. As Claire counseled one soldier after another, he sought to leave everyone with hope. He shared stories of those who had overcome difficult circumstances in order to help build the faith of his listeners. As Christmas approached, He knew his fellow prisoners could easily spiral into deeper depression, but his intention was to use the upcoming holiday as a symbol of hope. He reasoned that if he could get them thinking about the wonderful holiday gatherings at home, he would give them a motivation to persist against adversity and to believe that God would indeed manage their freedom. Perhaps getting them back home in time for the next Christmas. There's a young man you should see, whispered one POW to Claire urgently. He's an American talking about suicide. As Claire walked to see the young man, he realized it was one year to the day that he and his crew members had enjoyed that last meal on American soil. It was once again Christmas Eve. The 19-year-old was downcast and huddled on his bunk. I'm going to ram into that electric fence, he muttered with an angry voice. Why would you want to do that? asked Claire quietly. What's the use? asked the dejected young man. We're going to die in here anyway. Why not just get it over with? 
Claire sat down on the bed next to him. You don't want to do that, he said. This is Christmas Eve. This is the night that hope was born. Not a time for hope to be lost. The young man was quiet. Do you like music? asked Claire, trying to get the other man's thoughts onto something else. The young man remained quiet. Claire didn't rush him. He just waited. Yeah, I used to play the saxophone, murmured the young man. Really? I love the sound of a saxophone, said Claire quietly, beginning to move the young man's attention away from his woes. You like baseball, he asked. Yeah. What team? The Cubs. That was a new pathway of distraction. Claire talked about a time he had gone to a game. His favorite team, the Cincinnati Reds, had lost to the Chicago Cubs. After a while, a conversation was simply taking place between two American servicemen, far away from home. My name is Claire Miller, he said, stretching out a hand. I'm Ronnie, Ronnie Simpson. There was a momentary pause. Then Ronnie looked at Claire, asked a question of his own. You married? Yes, I am, said Claire. Would you like to see a picture of my wife? Ronnie nodded and watched as Claire pulled a picture of his wife from his wallet and showed it to him. But the young man's eyes averted. He became distracted as something else fell to the floor. He leaned to pick it up. It was another picture. He was shocked. Where did you get this? he demanded. Ronnie's change of attitude startled Claire. Then the memory came back to him. Ronnie was holding the picture of Sally, the waitress, that he tucked into his wallet exactly one year ago that day. That's the girl I'm going to marry. How did you get this? repeated the young man sternly. Claire was suddenly the one who was speechless. Finally, he drew in a breath and said, Ronnie, a few minutes ago we were talking about hope. Hope comes from God, and the evidence of faith and hope is the amazing things that only He can do that are beyond human comprehension. You and I, at this very moment, are witnessing one of His miracles. Claire went on to explain to Ronnie that last Christmas Eve, in a little diner in California, a sweet waitress named Sally had told of her boyfriend who was fighting for his country. She had demonstrated enormous faith by asking a bunch of strangers who were going off to war to deliver a picture of herself to her fiancé. She didn't even tell us your name, Ronnie. Think of that. Sally had such faith in God that she knew he would lead me to you to give you something of hope, a picture of her. Claire put a hand on Ronnie's shoulder. God knows right where you are, Ronnie. Think of that. Claire stood and took a mental snapshot that he would carry in his heart forever the scene of Ronnie sitting on the edge of his bed, gazing at the photo of his girlfriend, Sally. And on his face was the look of hope. Merry Christmas, Ronnie, said Claire, walking away. Thank you, God, he said on the inside. The rest of the story, Both Claire and Ronnie returned home safely. They got there in time for the next Christmas. Ronnie and Sally were married, and according to letters received from them by Claire, they lived happily ever after. Thanks for listening to the Godwink Christmas Podcast. Do you have a Godwink story to share? Go to shareyourgodwink.com and let us know. Thanks for listening, and share this podcast with a friend. The Godwink Christmas Podcast is produced by Godwink Brands and is available wherever you find your favorite podcasts.